Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Now in this video, we're going to be discussing the perineal muscles. Now, before we go any further, and this is probably obvious from the pictures here, this is not peroneal. Okay, when you see this with an O, peroneal, we're referring to the lateral leg compartment. So, for example, perineus longus, perineus brevis, which, by the way, are the same thing as fibularis longus and fibularis brevis. And because uh, this is actually the perineal region, and they sound so similar, there's actually been kind of an unofficial effort to change peroneus to fibularis in terms of the terminology. It's kind of slow catching on. But this is the perineal region and the perineal muscles. And we've got four of them to talk about. We've got ischiocavernosus over here, we've got bulbospongiosis, and then on the next slide, we've got the transverse perineals, both superficial and the deep branches. Now let's talk a little bit about these first two. The first one is the ischiocavernosus. And by the way, we are gonna see some gender-specific differences here. Not only in some of the origins and insertions, like you can see here, but also in the general anatomy. And it's gonna be reflected by the external genitalia and also the width of the pelvis. We'll see that as well. Uh, remember that women have a wider pelvis and also a larger Q angle or cubic angle. And so we'll actually see some differences there. And we'll point those out. First muscle is ischiocavernosus. So this is gonna originate in both males and females on the ischial tuberosity and the ischial ramus. Okay, so let's first identify the muscle. That's this first one right here. We'll look at it in males first. All right, so right here we've got, this is actually the patient's right ischiocavernosus. This is the left ischiocavernosus. So the origin is actually down here, and it's going to be more or less on that ischial tuberosity and ischial ramus. If we look over here in females, it's the same thing. So here's our ischiocavernosus right here, the right one. Here's the left. And again, the origin is going to be kind of over here on the ischial tuberosity and the ischial ramus. Now one thing to notice before we go any further, it's kind of an interesting thought, is that notice that the ischiocavernosus in males on either side goes down like this from the insertion to the origin at a smaller angle than it does in females, goes out a little bit wider. If you look at the triangle that this makes in females, you can see that up top it's a larger angle. And the reason for that actually has to do with the fact that females have a wider pelvis. Remember that these muscles are originating on the ischial tuberosity and ramus. So because the females have a wider pelvis, that's gonna force the origins a little bit further apart, and they're gonna have a, a larger angle uh, between the two muscles, all right? Now the insertions of ischiocavernosus, this is where we see our first case of sexual dimorphism. In males, the insertion is on the crus of the penis, and in females, it's on the crus of the clitoris. Now, um, the crus in females is a little bit more difficult to understand because for obvious reasons, their external genitalia is a lot smaller. So in males, it's a little bit easier to understand the crus. And to do that, we're gonna look at a separate picture that really is for a separate video. And you can see it right here. So right there in yellow, you can see the arrow, that's the crus of the penis, okay? It's really near the base of the penis and it attaches on this bone right here, which is actually the ischial ramus. So technically the penis and the clitoris in females are actually attached to the pelvis through the ischial ramus. And really the attachment is through this cruise. Now what they've done here is they've really just taken more or less a cross section of the penis. Okay, they've cut it off. We don't want to think about that. but um, And you're just looking at a cross section of the cruise. Uh, what we can actually do is do more of a, a coronal section and we can actually see that the cruise, which is right here, is actually not just a small, you know, circular structure. It actually has some length to it. And really, that ischiocavernosus is inserting on this cruise, so all along this length right here on both sides. Okay? The clitoris also has a cruise, and in females, that ischiocavernosus would insert on that as well. Now, the action of ischiocavernosus is really to push blood from the root of the clitoris in females and the root of the penis in males to the body. And this helps to maintain, first of all, produce, but also maintain an erection in both males and females. So obviously, males have erection of the penis, females have erection of the clitoris. So when we look back at this picture right here, this structure right here in the center, this is really the root of the penis, 
okay? And really all this down here is the body, okay? And so the job of ischiocavernosis is to push blood from the root into the body of the penis. In males, it does the same thing in females for the clitoris. And when you get blood into this area, that obviously produces erection. And you can even see these blood vessels in here. But again, get the blood in there, and it also maintains the blood in there as long as ischiocavernosis is still contracting. Now, for bulbospongiosis, bulbospongiosis has a sexually dimorphic origin. Okay? In males, the origin of bulbospongiosis, also called bulbocavernosis, is on the perineal body and the median penile raphae. All right, so let's first look at the male bulbospongiosis. So we'll zoom in on this picture over here. This muscle right here, you can see the right half of it, and here's the left. This is bulbospongiosis. Now, this structure right there where my mouse is, that is the perineal body. And so you can see that the bulbospongiosis is originating off of that, at least the more proximal part of bulbospongiosis. However, as this muscle goes distally, you can see it actually going about halfway through the length of the penis from the root to the glands. As it goes out distally, the origin is really on this midline right here, and you can't see it super well but you can see this tissue extend from the perineal body along this midline, and this midline tissue is called the median penile raphae. And so bulbospongiosis more distally originates from that rather than the perineal body, which is more proximally. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. In females, if we go over here, so here's the right bulbospongiosis, here's the left bulbospongiosis. Okay? Uh, in females, it just originates from the perineal body, and their perineal body is a little bit larger, actually quite a bit larger. Um, it's very small in males, a lot larger in females, but you can clearly see that it originates from that. Now, obviously, females would not have a me median penile raphe because they don't have a penis, right? So you don't see that here. So in females, the origin is only that perineal body, which happens to be a lot larger. Now for the insertions of bulbospongiosis. This is another case where we have pretty significant sexual dimorphism. So in males, the insertion of bulbospongiosis is pretty broad. Perineal membrane, dorsal aspect of the corpus spongiosum. Also, both the corpora cavernosa. Remember, you have a left and a right corpora, uh, corpus cavernosum. This is the plural and then the fascia of the bulb of the penis. Obviously, we can't see all of this. In fact, the perineal membrane is something we're gonna come back to in a future video. Okay, but for now, um, just understand that this bulbospongiosis really just inserts all the way up here, okay? In females, has a slightly uh, less broad or narrower or insertion, if you wanna think of it that way. It's gonna insert on the pubic arch, and the fascia of the corpora cavernosa and the clitoris. Okay? And you can see those muscles again right here. So the insertion is going more distally okay? on the pubic arch, which would be up here somewhere, and then also the fascia of the corpora cavernosa. You can also see it inserting on the clitoris there. Okay? Now for the action of bulbospongiosis, it again depends on the gender. So in males, it's going to compress the bulb of the penis during urination and ejaculation, and it's going to assist the function of ischiocavernosis. So ischiocavernosis more is involved in getting the erection and keeping it there, so maintaining it, whereas bulbospongiosis more just assists it by supporting the perineal body. Okay, Now, um, in terms of compressing the bulb of the penis during urination and ejaculation, I think we've all had the sensation where you're pretty much done urinating, right? And you can kind of contract your pelvic floor to squeeze the last bit of urine out. Uh, males can do the same thing with ejaculation. Um, that, that voluntary contraction, um, you're contracting other things, but one of the things is bulbospongiosis, and it's helping to get the remainder of whatever it is out of the urethra in males. Okay? In females, it's also going to assist the function of ischiocavernosis. It's going to assist in erection of the clitoris and the bulb of the vestibule and also support the perineal body. However, it does not have function in getting the last bit of, well, obviously not semen, but let's say urine, 
out of the urethra. And the reason for that is because only males have a urogenital system. Meaning in males, if you think about it, the urinary system and the reproductive system are linked. You have a urogenital system. Because not only can the penis uh, convey sperm or semen, it also conveys urine. In females, notice the vagina and the urethra are separate structures. So their urinary systems and reproductive systems are not linked like that. So, ish, so bulbospongiosis should have no function in terms of getting uh, urine out in females. Okay. Now, in terms of these innervations and blood supplies, they're the same. Uh, these two muscles, like the others that we're going to see on the next slide, they're all innervated by the deep branch of the perineal nerve. Now, we talked about this in the previous video. I'll kind of go here just for the moment. Um, we've got here the deep perineal nerve or deep branch of the perineal nerve. You can see all these muscles are innervated by that deep branch. Okay? That includes bulbospongiosis, ischiocavernosis, and then the transverse perineal muscles that we're going to see in just a second. Also, the blood supply is through the perineal artery, all right? which we also saw in a previous video. Now for these last two. These are pretty straightforward. There's really not a lot of gender-specific origins and insertions here. They're the same. Uh, the structures, anatomically speaking, will be a little bit different, as I'll point out. The transverse perineals, these have two parts. They have a superficial part and a deep part, which are considered separate muscles because the origins and insertions are different. So for the superficial transverse perineals, the origin is really the tendinous fibers from the inner and fore part of the ischial tuberosity. Okay? We can really just say tendons from the ischial tuberosity. Okay? So you can see this better in females. They're a lot larger in females. So this right here, these are the transverse perineal muscles. Now, we're looking at this from an inferior view, so from the floor, right? So the part we're seeing right here is most likely the superficial part. The deep part would be under it. We can't see it very well. But over in this area, we would have that ischial tuberosity. In fact, remember this muscle, which is ischiocavernosis, originated on the ischial tuberosity. So we're definitely in the right region. And this tendinous region right here, this is coming off of that ischial tuberosity. And you can see here that those uh, muscles, the superficial transverse perineals, they run medially and insert on the perineal body right here. Again, in females, that perineal body is going to be a lot larger. But also notice that um, the superficial transverse perineals in particular, they're going to join with two muscles. Okay, Posteriorly, so over here, they're going to fuse with the fibers of the external anal sphincter. But also anteriorly, you can see that with the fibers of bulbospongiosis that we just talked about. So all of these muscles, or at least some of them, the ones I've mentioned here, are intertwined, okay, which also helps to give some support here because after all, even though these are not the true pelvic floor muscles, uh, they're still having to bear a little bit of weight here in addition to exerting their own function. So having them intertwined provides some extra support. Now the action of, the, of this muscle is to constrict the urethra and the vagina and really just maintain urinary continence. These are pro-continence. If you have an issue with these muscles, one or more of them, you may have issues holding in urine, okay? And so you might have an incontinence problem. For the deep transverse perineals, again, they're going to be kind of under here. They're going to originate from the inferior ischial ramus, or the inferior portion of the, uh, the ischial ramus, okay, on either side. So they're going to be more or less under the superficial muscles, but again, they're coming off of the inferior part of the ischial ramus. And the way they actually run, and you kind of just have to picture this because we can't really see them too well, but they're actually going to run medially and insert on each other. They're not going to insert on a bone. They actually insert on each other. So the deep transverse perineal on the left side, or really in this picture of the patient's right, is going to run medially and insert on the deep transverse perineal on the patient's left side. And so they're going to kind of cross brace each other. And so when they contract, they pull the origins toward one another. Okay? And so if you think about this, the deep transverse perineals contracting and pulling their origins toward each other, that is the two ischial rami, and you think about the superficial part over here where everything's kind of cross braced, right? everything's being pulled medially. And so pretty much anything in that vicinity is going to get constricted. Okay? And so, for example, the urethra will be constricted. The vagina will be 
constrict it. And so overall, all these muscles right here are for the purpose of procontinence. These two right here, procontinence, the previous two are more um, dealing with sexual function, you know, maintaining and, and keeping an erection, okay, in both males and females. Now, again, like the other two that we just talked about, these two transverse perineal muscles are both innervated by the deep branch of the perineal nerve. Um, I know I didn't include that in this picture right here, but it's also the deep transverse perineal muscle, not just the superficial part, okay? So, hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of these four perineal muscles. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.